Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Orion 80ED, an 80mm f7.5 apochromatic refractor, a true classic in our hobby. This thing has been in the Orion catalog for a very long time, almost 20 years. In fact, those of you with long memories may recall that I did a review of this product for the February 2004 issue of Sky and Telescope. Hard to believe it's already been 17 years. $499 buys you just the optical tube assembly alone. Intermediate to advanced astronomers will need what they have to get this thing going. Finder, diagonal, eyepiece, rings, plate, and of course the all-important mount. If you're just getting started, you are going to have to get all of those materials yourself. Sometimes in the Orion catalog, they will package this from time to time with certain accessories, including mounts. Check their recent catalog and see what they're offering at the time that you order. So here we are with the telescope and all of the aforementioned accessories on it. Let's put it on a mount and see how it looks. And here we are with the Orion ED80. And this telescope is small enough and short enough and light enough that you could, in fact, use it conceivably full time on a small to mid sized Alt as tripod like this Vixen Porta. At only 600 millimeters, you can do this as a beginner and find things fairly easily. With a 25 millimeter eyepiece attached, it's only got about 24 power. Beginners need early success, and at 24 power, it's going to give you a good chance to find whatever you're looking for. So I do want to draw your attention to one thing. Every one of these that I've ever seen has had this three inch long aluminum block mounted to the bottom of the optical tube. It's drilled and tapped for a quarter inch by 20 screw. Uh, I wouldn't use that thing. I don't trust how stable it is. Do the right thing, get rings and a plate. Now, some people I know go in there and they actually remove that block. The reason is because depending on the kind of rings and plate that you get, it can interfere with you sliding the rings up and down the tube to achieve proper balance. By the way, these things make really good travel scopes. I know somebody once who went on an African safari and he didn't want to risk his astrophysics or teleview refractors. He didn't feel comfortable taking his Quest Star, so he just got one of these things and it was great. It was fine. You know, I, I have mixed feelings about that. I understand you have valuable equipment, but on the other hand, uh, that's what it was designed for. It was designed to be used, so you're not going to take it with you. Just go ahead and use it. But anyhow, uh, this may look a little long to get on an airplane if you wanted to take it on with you, but you actually can do it. So the dew shield here comes off and the diagonal also comes off like this. And then you rack the focuser in like this. If you need another inch or so, this visual back does unscrew. You get everything down like this, you can get the telescope to about 18 inches. You can take that on the plane with you. The mount, yeah, you're going to have to check that. So this is how I used it on a traditional equatorial mount. So what can you see with this telescope? Well, if you're just starting out, you're going to have a ball. You're looking at showpiece objects like the Andromeda Galaxy, the Pleiades, the Orion Nebula, and all sorts of clusters. Every season is going to bring new things for you to look at. For planetary, the planets are kind of gone right now. Jupiter and Saturn have set in the west as I'm filming this, and Mars is receding. From previous experience, I've seen several of these. These do really, really well on Jupiter and Saturn. On double stars, refractors are really good for this sort of thing. Eta Cass, Gamma Andromeda, and I noticed in my review that I wrote back in 2004 that I split Delta Cygnus with one of these. That's normally a good test for a four inch refractor. The problem with Delta Cygnus isn't the separation. It's about two and a half arc seconds, which is tight, but it's not super tight. The problem with Delta Cygnus is that the primary component is so much brighter than the secondary. If you have lousy optics, the brighter component just sort of blows out the secondary and you can't see it. So Iota Cassiopeia has a similar two and a half arc second separation, except both components are about the same brightness, and I was able to split those with a nice black space in between them. I used a 7 millimeter Nagler and a 2x Barlow at 171 power. That's getting down there, but uh, yes, I could split them. 171 power is getting a little bit high for a 3 inch telescope. As far as deep sky goes, yes, the showpiece objects are well within your reach, but there is a limit to how much a 3 inch aperture is going to show you. 
depending on how you calculate it, the limiting magnitude is somewhere around 11.2. Dawes limit is somewhere around one and a half arc seconds. Keep in mind, those are under ideal conditions. So again, if you've never looked through a telescope before, you're gonna have a ball looking at all the showpiece objects. If you're going to be looking at something dimmer, then your options start to narrow a little bit. And I'll give you an example. There's a cluster M35 in Gemini. I've talked about this cluster before. But there's a smaller companion cluster, NGC 2158, that is nearby. In a 3-inch or 4-inch refractor, that small cluster is not a problem. But there's a similar pair of clusters nearby, and this is M38. It's a few degrees away, but it looks like a smaller, dimmer pair of M35 and NGC 2158. M38 has a smaller cluster of its own nearby called NGC 1917. With this telescope, yeah, I could see M38, and I know where to look to see 1917. It's getting a little bit down there. So something to think about. Uh, you can see the major objects, but you know the dimmer ones start to fade from the view. Here's another example, M81 and M82 in Ursa Major. This is everybody's favorite pair of galaxies in the Big Dipper. M81 is a perfect looking spiral and M82 is a, well, it's, it's an imperfect cigar shaped irregular galaxy. They look like eyebrows or whiskers hanging out in space. And the contrast between the perfect M81 and the imperfect M82 makes a nice view in the eyepiece. Now, if you have good, unobstructed, clear northern horizons, you can see those galaxies no problem in a 3-inch telescope like this one. And I looked at those several times through the course of this review. But let's look again at that image. There are at least a couple of other galaxies in the field of view, NGC 3077 and NGC 2976. This image was taken through the Skywatcher Evo Star 100. That is a four inch refractor. And through the four inch, you can see those dim galaxies. Uh, yeah, the conditions have to be good. They're kind of dim, but you can catch them. On this three inch, yeah, I could see them. I think it's largely because I know exactly where they are and what to look for, but those things are starting to fade from view. So the question becomes, is a three inch aperture telescope enough for you as your only telescope? You're going to find differing opinions on that. Some people are going to say yes. For me, I don't know. I think I'd, if I had one of these as my only scope, I would also want to have a six, eight, or 10 inch something else uh, for those deep sky nights. So what I said before about the limiting magnitude and Dawes limit for a three inch telescope, if you have an eight inch telescope, you tend not to think about that stuff, you just go observing. By the way, if you like that sort of thing, Ursa Major or the Big Dipper is filled with galaxies. You can really go to town on those with a bigger telescope. There are guys in the club who are real galaxy studs and they can just rattle off all this information about all those galaxies in the Big Dipper. They're a lot better than, at that than I am. And by the way, looking at those galaxies, you know, one cynical definition of, a, of an astronomer is we can look at those little wisps in the eyepiece. They're not visually exciting, but it's more the idea of what you're seeing. It's a galaxy. It's a whole galaxy you're seeing in the eyepiece. You're seeing it live. It's the actual photons of light that have traveled untold miles to get to us. A galaxy is probably the largest thing you'll ever see. We see galaxies in the eyepiece, and what do we do? We go, yeah, galaxy. But you know what really gets us excited? Airplane flying through the field of view. If an airplane flies through the field of view of your eyepiece, you will jump up and tell everyone around you. But you know we see galaxies in the eyepiece and we go, yeah, galaxy. So anyway, this model is very well known as a sort of gateway drug into astrophotography. Some of you people are getting some amazing images through these things. I'm not even sure how you're even doing some of these, but I know that you're getting them because you send me examples. So if you're looking to dabble into deep sky astrophotography, I'll go ahead and show this to you. You do need this, it's a field flattener. And again, if you're just doing visual work, if you're just going to look through your telescope, you do not need this device. So don't get this if you're just gonna look through your telescope. Anyhow, it's about $275 and they do make one that's dedicated for the ED80. But this is the field flattener for the Skywatcher Evo Star 100 that I showed you before. And these are actually from the same series of telescope. And you could actually say that, uh, you know, I could just take the Evo Star 100 review and, you know, downsize it by 20%. You get the review of this thing. 
That's true on paper, but I think the buyer of this telescope is a different kind of person. They're looking for portability. So anyhow, the way this works is there's a T-ring that's attached on the back here, and you have to get the wider mouth M48 T-ring that has the wider opening on it, as opposed to the more common M42. But anyhow, this is the visual back of the telescope, and it actually looks like one piece, uh, but it's two. This part comes off, and what's left on here is a retaining ring, and you do that for rotation. So whatever you screw this thing on like this, whatever rotation you like, uh, you just back this off like this. Let's say you want to do that. So um, let's take this camera, just grab this one. This is a T3i, um, go like that, and there you go. So the question sometimes comes up, can you use these things as telephoto lenses? And the answer is yes, of course you can do this. I know birders and wildlife photographers who do this, and these things aren't quite as convenient or as practical as a dedicated telephoto lens for your camera, but they are a lot cheaper. Good lenses in this focal length range can cost up to 10 times what this telescope does. But with the field flattener in place, it is also a focal reducer, this Orion ED80 becomes a 510 millimeter f6.3 or thereabouts telephoto lens. Here's a picture of an observing field that we sometimes use. This is the 50 millimeter view, and this approximates the view of a human eye. And put the camera on the ED80, and it looks like this. This is a close up of the rust colored silo on the right hand side. So there you have it, an overview of the Orion ED80 Apochromatic Refractor. I've always liked this telescope, I've seen a lot of them through the years, and I can't recall ever seeing one that was less than very good, so I can reliably recommend these to you. They're easy to like, they're easy to use, and they're not all that expensive considering what you get. My only question if you're just getting started, is a 3-inch aperture enough for you to be your only telescope? Anyway, I hope I've given you some information to decide whether this is right for you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.